single muscle fiber discharge is not the whole motor unit. And then if you had reinnervation, if you had say a partial injury where one axon was killed, the other guys are okay. Then this axon, uh, this motor unit says, you know what, I know there are some denervated muscle fibers out there. I'm gonna try to save those muscle fibers. I'm gonna send new sprouts out and reinnervate those denervated muscle fibers. And these new sprouts come from the distal uh, axon terminal or from the distal nodes of RON-V8 and they reinnervate these denervated muscle fibers. And we know that because when this guy fires, he doesn't look the same as normal. Uh, he, uh, uh, his new sprouts are poorly myelinated. They don't synchronize as well. And the motor unit becomes larger in amplitude. There are more muscle fibers supplied, more polyphasic because they don't synchronize as well. And also a longer duration from start to finish, uh, again, because of the poor synchronization, also the total number of uh, mo uh, muscle fibers in the unit. Uh, so that would be a sign of re that's occurred, which is a little bit more chronic. Now, we talked about positive waves and fibs in denervation. It's not specific to axon loss, unfortunately. And if we think about a myopathy, uh, in many myopathies, you'll get uh, what we call segmental necrosis. Uh, and so with segmental necrosis, you'll see some normal muscle fiber, then you'll see a necrotic area. Then there's a part distally over here, which is functionally denervated. It no longer has the supply from its uh, axon. And so when that happens, this gray area will start to fire on its own. And that will also be exhibited as, uh, as uh, positive sharp waves or fibrillations. So positive waves and fibs, not just seen in, uh, in denervation, but also seen in myopathies. Uh, the myopathic motor units, they look different from the neuropathic motor units. In this same model, let's say we have a few of these muscle fibers that have died off. Well, if you have less muscle fibers, you're gonna have a smaller amplitude motor unit. It'll also be shorter duration because reduced number of muscle fibers. And it may be polyphasic because the muscle fiber conduction is not normal and they don't all synchronize as well as they normally would. So these would be myopathic motor units. So let's just come back uh, to the critical illness myopathy. Uh, so in that setting, electrophysiologic testing, as we talked about, shows reduced amplitude CMAPs with uh, preservation of sensory responses. And then you'll, you will see some fibrillations for the reasons we just mentioned because of that the muscle fiber necrosis. If the patient can participate and can give you just a few motor units and uh, frankly, a lot of times they can't, they're sedated, they're not really awake and alert enough to do that. Then you may see some of these myopathic small amplitude motor unit action potentials, but you just can't count on that. It doesn't always work that way. They can't really recruit well enough to uh, give you a good, uh, a good motor unit analysis. In the critical illness polyneuropathy, that's where you'll have a, a symmetric distal sensory motor axonal neuropathies. These are primarily axonal, not demyelinating. Uh, they can affect, of course, the distal limb muscles. Now, often, if uh, we're electromyographers, we'll get called to the ICU to say, I can't get this guy off the ventilator. And it's, a, they, it's perceived as a respiratory muscle weakness. But in fact, all the limbs are weak. And it's not just the phrenic nerves that are weak. It's the, all the limbs. And it can also affect the sensory and autonomic nerves. In this setting, the electrodiagnosis demonstrates abnormal both sensory and motor responses and the needle EMG shows fibrillations uh, and perhaps reduced recruitment of motor units, uh, reduced numbers of motor units, and the guys who are there are firing faster, uh, faster than normal. So are these two separate entities? Uh, it's, I think it's increasingly recognized that both the critical illness myopathy and polyneuropathy are not necessarily purely distinct entities. And, uh, uh, unfortunately, many patients have both CIP and CIM at the same time. And we think of this now as an overlapping spectrum triggered by an overall acute inflammatory response, often occurring simultaneously. They're probably both there at the same time. So let's just talk a little bit about risk factors for ICU-acquired weakness, and then we'll talk about treatment as well, prevention and treatment. So there are risk factors pre-hospital before they ever came, got sick and came in the hospital. There are disease severity risk factors, and then there are treatment risk factors. So pre-hospital function, if you look at actually analysis of patients pre-hospital functional data, 
who are subsequently admitted for severe sepsis. Many of the symptoms of the post-ICU syndrome, the weakness, were present before admission. So if you have an elderly, frail uh, person with multiple comorbidities, they may actually have sarcopenia and weakness before they ever got in the hospital. And you have to take that into account as you're thinking about the ICU acquired weakness. And accounting for the pre-hospital functional trajectory uh, appears to help define the care trajectory after critical illness. Uh, so if they were getting weaker and sarcopenic before, ever they got, uh, before they ever got to the ICU, that may actually continue to progress. Uh, so th the data that are out, th out there highlight the increasing recognition that pre-hospital function informs what's gonna happen in hospital and post-hospital uh, impairments. Uh, so this may account for some of the variants and phenotypes that we see and how people respond differently to intervention. Here's a reference. And like I said at the beginning, I think I've given uh, Sudhir our, uh, my slides. So all these references will be available to you afterwards. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the disease risk factors. So despite dozens of studies, and it's probably, it's beyond dozens right now, looking at clinical risk factors for ICU acquired weakness, there's not a complete certainty over which factors are truly causal, which ones really cause ICU acquired weakness. The most consistently implicated risk factors are those associated with severity of illness. So shock, sepsis, degree of multi-organ failure. We pretty we have pretty good agreement that those are strong risk factors. Uh, the severity of illness is probably your strongest risk factor. So this would help to support the premise that ICU acquired weakness is actually, it's just another manifestation of multiple organ uh, dysfunction. Uh, uh, cohort studies in patients who are critically ill show an uh, association between sepsis and ICU-acquired weakness in unadjusted analysis with odd ratios between 2.9 and 49. So uh, depending on the studies, uh, uh, if you have sepsis, you have between a three and a 50-fold uh, risk factor for ICU-acquired weakness. That's a strong association, sepsis and ICU-acquired weakness. And here again is the study. Uh, that's looked at that. Uh, so sepsis, clearly a strong risk factor. Now, treatment risk factors, uh, that's, a, uh, that's where it becomes more nebulous and more uncertain. There are a number of uh, ICU uh, interventions or exposures identified as potential risk factors for ICU-acquired weakness. So administration of corticosteroids has been looked at, and we'll talk about each of these in a, in a bit. Uh, neuromuscular blockade has been looked at. Poor, poor glycemic control, uh, aminoglycosides, and immobilization. Those are all potential risk factors. Uh, there are conflicting data on the uh, uh, associations between corticosteroid use and neuromuscular blockade with ICU acquired weakness. Uh, it's not really as clearly a risk factor as we initially thought. Uh, and part of the problem is that the overall effect of corticosteroids on acquired weakness remains uncertain and difficult to ascertain because of indication bias, high variability in patient phenotypes and steroid dosing. So the sickest people are gonna be more likely to get steroids. They're the ones who are also likely to get ICU acquired weakness and the steroid dosing is not consistent. It's not like everyone gets the exact same dose of steroids. So a uh, little unclear what the, the contribution from uh, steroids is. Uh, pathophysiology of uh, critical illness polyneuropathy. There are a number of theories and uh, uh, maybe some of you on the, uh, on the call uh, will have uh, uh, more knowledge of this than I do, but uh, uh, still, as far as I can see from the literature, not completely certain what the uh, pathophysiology is. There are some uh, questions about whether it might be loss of the blood brain barrier as part of it. Uh, perhaps inexcitability of the endoneural uh, membrane, uh, perhaps a direct toxic effect from ICU therapies, including hyperglycemia or lipids in the parenteral nutrition. We don't, we're not really certain of the underlying uh, pathophysiology at this point. Critical illness uh, myopathy, uh, we're in sort of a similar uh, st uh, state. The histologic study of muscle biopsy specimens demonstrates atrophy, there's a preferential loss of thick filaments with, uh, which reflects myosin loss and muscle necrosis. And again, we have some proposed uh, uh, theories uh, 
uh, which includes uh, uh, chemokine-induced auto autophagy of muscle, muscle membrane inexcitability, channelopathies, or again, a direct toxic effect of ICU care. But unfortunately, we don't really know for certain the underlying uh, pathophysiology behind this. Let's talk a little bit about prognosis. So uh, this is not a great prognosis. Once you get ICU acquired weakness, you don't have a, uh, as good a prognosis for making it out uh, either alive or well. So here's a propensity match cohort of patients who are critically ill. Uh, here they defined ICU acquired weakness using the MRC scale, those who are weak on clinical examination. If you were weak, you had a 30% lower likelihood of just being alive at hospital discharge. Uh, so that's a significant uh, drop in survival. And uh, even at one year after, uh, if you were discharged, you had a 13% increase in mortality at one year. So these people who have uh, ICU at acquired weakness, uh, at least defined by the MRC scale, they are a group of sick people who have a lower likelihood of being discharged alive and a higher likelihood of dying in the first year. So this is a reflection of bad uh, disease. Uh, in another study, patients receiving mechanical ventilation who developed ICU acquired weakness had a lower physical uh, functioning, health-related quality of life, the SF36. So the physical functioning score on the SF36, they had uh, 45 uh, if they had ICU-acquired weakness versus 75 if they did not. So that's a significant uh, uh, drop in the uh, physical functioning score. Uh, higher strength scores uh, were associated with a higher uh, physical functioning score. And if you look at the, uh, the, pr pr the de decrease in the uh, PFS, ICU acquired weakness was associated with a 16.7 uh, point decrease. So those who have uh, ICU acquired weakness do have a significant lower physical functioning after discharge. It's really a, uh, not a good prognosis that way. Is there a difference in prognosis between the two? There is some data and it's a little hard to interpret because they're again, not completely distinct entities that the myopathy has a better prognosis than the polyneuropathy. But again, there's considerable overlap between these two. and We don't always have just one, uh, one diagnosis. Now, what about subclinical disease? Uh, are there people who have uh, ICU acquired weakness that you might just not pick up because of all the difficulties with detection? This is one study looking at 730 patients with respiratory failure uh, without weakness. So didn't have uh, observed weakness in the ICU. Uh, and they did the uh, fibular motor study to EDB that I mentioned before. Uh, and if you had an abnormal CMAP, compound muscle action potential on day eight, that was associated with a higher one-year mortality, 48% in the groups with the abnormal mortality in the groups with uh, abnormal CMAP, versus 29% in the groups with a normal CMAP. So even if you don't detect weakness on your clinical exam, if you have a small or absent CMAP, then you have a higher risk of mortality at one year. So this seems to be uh, fairly predictive for people who are gonna do poorly by doing that uh, fibular motor response. Let's talk a bit about prevention. And there are actually ways to prevent uh, this. There is a building literature regarding early exercise to maintain muscle strength and improve function in patients in the ICU. Uh, there are prospective cohort studies uh, in patients with acute respiratory failure that show that mobility in patients receiving mechanical ventilation is safe, feasible, and associated with reductions in length and stay of mortality. By mobility, and this is uh, hard to believe, but what people have done is while you're on the ventilator, get people awake enough to actually stand and take a few steps. Uh, the nurses don't like doing this at all. They get very nervous and it takes a lot of nursing time, but this is what's associated with a, a prevention of uh, ICU acquired weakness. There's been multiple studies on this and uh, that simple step seems to be uh, preventive. Uh, there was a randomized control study in patients performing activity through physical or occupational therapy, therapy within 48 hours of respiratory failure. And they showed that by doing this, you had an improvement in ADL independence, 60% versus 35%, and a greater walking distance at hospital discharge, uh, 33 meters versus zero meters on average. Uh, 
and a very significant difference here. And this is a randomized study. So it looks like having people stand up and take a few steps while they're on the ventilator is uh, quite effective at prevention. And here's the reference if you uh, wish to look at it from Lancet. Uh, now there have been multiple uh, RCTs uh, and uh, uh, looking at uh, early mobilization and it looks like it's an effective treatment for ICU acquired weakness. That is if you have an early mobilization your odds ratio of getting ICU acquired weakness is only 0.27. It's about one quarter the chance if you have uh, mobilization to get ICU weakness than if you didn't mobilize. So this seems to be an effective uh, prevention for ICU acquired weakness. Now, it is hard to get people out of bed when they're ICU and they're on a ventilator. So the question came up, could you do neuromuscular stimulation, electrical stimulation? And uh, uh, recent systematic review, and there's been multiple studies on this, says, you know what, it's probably not effective at present, preventing ICU acquired weakness. Don't really know why. Um, it may be the standing, it may be that just doesn't get enough muscles working, I don't really know. Uh, but there is no significant difference between uh, neuromuscular electrical stimulation and usual care on any of these measures, strength, mortality, duration of mechanical ventilation, or length of stay. So. While we would have hoped that uh, stimulating muscles would get us there, doesn't look like it does, unfortunately. Um, and there's some nice uh, meta-analysis on this. Um, now, just in terms of ICU care, the routine features of general care provided in the ICU have traditionally included liberal use of sedation and immobilization of patient. Just easier to have them asleep and in bed, not moving, that was easiest for the team. And we also thought that this was necessary for facilitating interventions to normalize physiologic function by artificial means. We'll just watch the numbers, get everything uh, in good physiologic range. Uh, but recently there has been a paradigm shift away from this approach to a more of a less is more philosophy for patients in the ICU. That is, let's do less uh, sedation, maybe a little bit more mobilization and that would uh, um, uh, be more effective. Uh, now, once uh, let's talk a little bit about treatment. Once patients have developed ICU-acquired weakness, it would be of use to know which interventions are most likely to restore uh, previous function. So the exact type of rehabilitation interventions uh, required to reduce impairment, maximize functional independence, and improve health-related quality of life, not yet well understood. Uh, we don't know exactly which rehabilitation is gonna be most effective. Uh, to date, there have been limited studies to evaluate intensive inpatient-based and outpatient rehab programs. So uh, just we're reaching the end and a few just take home points uh, that I'd like you to remember, then we'll go to the Q&A and please submit your Q&A uh, in, uh, in the Q&A box on uh, Zoom. ICU acquired weakness is very common. Uh, remember that uh, up to two thirds of people will have this if they've been on a mechanical uh, ventilator. Our ability to detect ICU acquired weakness is suboptimal. Measuring strength in the uh, ICU is challenging uh, because of, primarily because of patient sedation and cooperation. Uh, probably our best uh, test is to do nerve conductions, fibular, motor, and sural sensory responses. Uh, risk factors to think about Pre-hospital function, think about pre-hospital function, and that's gonna help establish the trajectory post-ventilation. Uh, Disease severity is your primary risk factor. The sicker you are, sepsis, the longer you're on the ventilator, those are gonna be the primary risk factors. Maybe steroids, maybe neuromuscular blockers, maybe glycemic control. Those are more questionable than the first two. Uh, so those are maybes. The pathophysiology, unfortunately, is not completely understood, but we do know that early mobilization and less sedation are likely preventive and may be helpful uh, to prevent uh, uh, ICU acquired weakness. Other treatments less clear. We don't think that neuromuscular electrical stimulation helps. Uh, people, I didn't mention this earlier, but we don't think bicycle ergometer in bed helps. You really have to get up and do some walking. Uh, if you're looking for review articles uh, on this, uh, and this is a constantly evolving uh, field. These are three good review articles to take a look at uh, in the literature. 
I do think we're going to be seeing more of these patients as uh, we have more COVID patients coming in the uh, ICU. So let me stop there, and I'm glad to uh, take questions if that's good. Uh, let me go to the Q&A box. Uh, is that okay, Sudhir, if I take uh, questions at this point? I think, uh, thank, first of all, thank, thanks very much for a very nice and informative talk. And Dr. Rakesh Singh is with us, and he's going to take us through the questions and answers. So he will put the question up, and then you can answer it. Okay. Is, is Sounds yeah. great. Rakesh, you want to take over? Yes, sir. I'll take the questions. Can you can you uh, can you uh, hear me, sir? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'll just put on. A, there are few questions. How frequent is myositis uh, ossificans seen in patients with uh, a critical illness uh, myopathy? Um, I don't really have a a number. Uh, I have to say I haven't seen it myself. Uh, um, uh, I haven't seen it myself. So if it occurs, I don't think it's particularly common uh, with the exception that there are some patients. So for instance, burn patients who have been in the ICU, burn ICU for a while, they are more likely to see myositis ossificans or heterotopic ossification. Uh, so that would be it, but that might be a different sort of risk factor than the critically ill. Maybe after, uh, typically after fracture neck fever in that limb, we see, I mean, uh, diffuse uh, myositis of ossificans is a little unusual. Maybe yeah, that's inflammatory right. myopathy, and you see, yeah. Yeah. dermatomyositis. Okay. Yeah. 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 I don't think you see it in this group too commonly, though. Uh, but, and, and you're right, in the, in the uh, traumatic injury, that's right. Uh, if you have a traumatic injury to the muscle, you could certainly see that too. Then, sir, how long one takes to develop CIM or CIP after admission in, in the... Uh, in, uh, yeah, that's a, it's a yeah. good question. I, I wish I had a better answer to this because it, uh, it depends on the uh, severity of the illness and yeah. uh, uh, perhaps on the pre-hospital trajectory, how weak you were and how many comorbidities you had uh, before you came in the hospital. It's in the range of days. It's not weeks or months. It's in the range of days. Uh, but I don't know that we have a great handle on how many days it takes. It's, and uh, sir, does, does the time of onset depends on certain, uh, certain factors? Yeah, I think if, you're, if you have uh, uh, sepsis, you have multi-organ failure, uh, if you came in weak uh, and frail, that it's uh, more likely to develop earlier. But I don't know that there's great data on that. Uh, maybe the other, uh, Satish, you may know, uh, or Sudhir, you may have some information okay. on that. I would uh, say, but it's in the days range. Uh, do you would you agree that generally it would parallel the course of the sepsis? So if if the person goes into multi-organ failure, the weakness also would happen at that time. You won't have the multi-organ failure improving and then uh, uh, critical illness developing later when the person is improving. Not like GBS or something like that. Right, right. No, I agree. That's a, that's a very good point. It would parallel the course of the disease. Uh, then, sir, what is the role of passive exercise in preventing critical illness neuropathy? Yeah, you know, because uh, it's a great question. Because um, uh, because it's so hard to get these patients standing and walking when they're on the ventilator, um, it would be great if there was something easier we could do that would uh, substitute and also prevent IC acquired weakness. But I'm afraid we don't have such a thing. And so uh, passive exercise doesn't seem to be preventive. Uh, having a bicycle ergometer in bed where people sort of uh, you know, uh, rotate their legs, that doesn't seem to be preventive. Like I said, neuromuscular stimulation, no. Uh, so I don't think passive exercise would prevent the neuropathy. Now, of course, it might be useful still to prevent contractures and uh, might be helpful in other ways, but I don't think it, it prevents the critical illness. And so there is a question, would vigorous passivity uh, exacerbate myopathy? Uh, not that I know of, uh, not that I know of. Um, uh, now, of course, you if you have super vigorous uh, uh, stretching, could you perhaps get some muscle injury? I suppose you could. Uh, but uh, I think just your sort of normal range of uh, physiotherapy, nothing I know of uh, uh, would be uh, a risk factor. Uh, Larry, what is the 
most severe grade of weakness that you have seen. I mean, do you get neck flexion grade two or something like that? Usually, neck flexion is not affected. Or what about uh, dysphagia or um, dysarthria or diplopia? I mean, those cranial nerves uh, probably would not get affected. I haven't seen the cranial nerves affected as much. I think uh, uh, neck flexion sometimes yes. Uh, one of the you know downsides is we don't they're not great at doing a man, manual muscle test exam. So it's not always possible to get an accurate measure, but I tend to see the limb muscles more affected. And then also uh, the, uh, the ICU docs say, hey, we can't get this guy off the ventilator. So uh, the respiratory muscles would be affected as well. But I haven't seen that much in the cranial nerves being affected. I think that's uh, less, much less common. Is that your experience also? Yes, absolutely. Then, sir, uh, there is a question. Do neuro neurosurgical patients like head injuries who do not have septicemia but remain in the uh, uh, remain remain in the ICU due to being due to being delirious develop uh, ICU acquired weakness? I haven't seen that as commonly. Uh, so, patients say uh, acquired brain injury, traumatic brain injury, or aneurysm. Uh, those kinds of neurosurgical patients, uh, if they're in the ICU, but they, they're not septic, they don't have organ failure, uh, they're not uh, uh, you know, sick in other ways, uh, I don't see them as commonly as having ICU acquired weakness. It's primarily the sepsis uh, is sepsis. the uh, uh, and multi-organ failure. Those are the big, uh, big risk factors. Similarly, uh, probably in the cardiac ICU, you don't see it so often. Yeah, I agree. I agree in the, in the cardiac. Uh, now, of course, if they develop an ARDS-like syndrome, that's, that's a risk factor. But uh, uh, yeah, pure cardiac disease with otherwise healthy, uh, not so much. Um, I found most of the time the reference doesn't come because the person is weak, because that is accepted that he's going to be weak. But it happens when they try to get the person off a ventilator and they can't get him off a ventilator and then the reference comes to the neurologist that has he got something. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really good point uh, is that we'll get contacted to say, uh, this guy is coming off the ventilator. Maybe there's a phrenic nerve injury. So could you study the phrenic nerves? And well, so I don't want to... Uh, so don't go down that pathway of having sort of a myopic view of just uh, phrenic nerves and just the diaphragm. Uh, uh, it, uh, take the whole, you know, take a look at the whole patient to see if it's a widespread uh, neuromuscular problem rather than just phrenic nerves. It, now, of course, they don't move anyway. So if they're sedated, so it won't be apparent that they're weak in the limbs. And so I understand why the ICU doc is asking that, but uh, just, and you all know this, but just take a wide look. Yes, and how to differentiate GBS from uh, CIP? Yeah, great question. So how to differentiate the Guillain-Barre or AIDP from, uh, uh, from a critical illness neuropathy? The critical illness neuropathy is primarily an axonal uh, neuropathy, uh, axon loss. Uh, and you don't really get much in the way of demyelination. So uh, in the critical illness neuropathy, you'd see small amplitude or absent sensory responses, uh, same thing for the motors, but the responses when they're present, they would be a normal uh, velocity. You shouldn't really see uh, um, uh, conduction block. You shouldn't see prolonged distal latencies. Uh, in the Guillain-Barre or AIDP, that's primarily a demyelinating neuropathy. So what you would see there that would trigger your thought, you'd say, oh, gee, the latencies are very long. The velocities are, uh, show a marked patchy slowing. I can't get F waves, uh, I have conduction block. Those would be the hints for Guillain-Barre. Uh, and uh, uh, as the question uh, suggests, really important to differentiate those two because you would go down a different pathway if you had GPS in terms of treatment. And sir, how often do you see uh, isolated myopathy or, 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 or the neuropathy? Isolated ones. Pure. Yeah, isolated one. I wish I could give you a good answer on that. And the problem is that uh, once you have, say, a critical illness polyneuropathy, as we talked about before, you would have small amplitude motor and sensory responses. They would already be small. So could you detect a myopathy on top of that 
uh, that's a tough one uh, to, to know for sure that you also have myopathy. There are some techniques to do direct muscle stimulation, which might help you. Um, uh, but uh, it's real, at least in my experience, uh, occasionally we'll see a pure myopathy where the sensories are beautiful and the motor responses are small. Uh, that's a relatively you know, smaller percentage of the total. I don't have a number. Uh, and sometimes you'll see what we think is a pure polyneuropathy, but frequently they're, they're coexisting. When we do see the pure myopathy, when the sensories are great, but just the motor responses are small and long duration, that's probably a bit of a better prognosis that you're gonna do better prognostically uh, than if you had the polyneuropathy, which is a worse prognosis. Sir, how do you do the nerve conduction and EMG test? Do you do it at the bedside or you shift the patient to the lab? Yeah, these people are very sick. They're on the ventilator and uh, it's really hard to move them. So uh, we typically bring the EMG machine up to the uh, intensive care unit and do the nerve conductions there. Uh, of course, uh, there are technical issues with doing that. Uh, you have a ton of 60 cycle artifact in the ICU. So you have to be very meticulous about your technique, cleaning off the skin, put your machine on the opposite side of the patient as all the machinery is, plug into a different plug that's not, you don't have other stuff plugged into. Uh, one little trick if you're doing needle EMG that not everyone knows is if you're getting a lot of 60 cycle on your needle EMG, uh, that's usually because of impedance mismatch. You have a a surface reference, which has one impedance, and a needle in the muscle, which has a different impedance. And when those two are different, uh, it'll accentuate the 60 cycle. So if you have a second needle to use as your reference, put that just under the skin, then that impedance is matched with the, uh, the active uh, needle, and you'll uh, get rid of a lot of the 60 cycle that way. Uh, but we do go to the ICU. It's just uh, too hard to get the patient to come down to the lab. So then there's a question that in critical illness myopathy, the CMAP durations are classically prolonged. Their duration of that graph is actually prolonged. What is the reason for that? I wish I knew. Uh, it has to do, I think, with the muscle fiber membranes uh, uh, and the slowing of conduction of the muscle fiber membranes, I think. But I don't uh, really know for sure. I know empirically that's what we see is a very long duration CMAP. Uh, maybe Satish or Sudhir, you might have some thoughts on why you get a prolonged duration CMAP. Uh, uh, no. Okay. Uh, uh, but that's what you see. Uh, uh, so if you see that small amplitude, very long duration, uh, think, oh, that's really strange. That's uh, more likely critical on this myopathy. Yeah. Sir, is there a link to uh, B12 deficiency, underlying B12 deficiency, and uh, which can precipitate the ICU acquired weakness? Are there any studies where B12 levels were assessed in patients of ICU acquired weakness? Uh, I don't know of any linkage between B B12 deficiency and ICU acquired weakness. Of course, B12 deficiency can create its own uh, polyneuropathy. You can certainly get a polyneuropathy from that tends to affect uh, sensory fibers more than, uh, uh, more than motor fibers. Uh, so that could be a cause on itself. But I don't know of any studies uh, uh, that, suggest, um, uh, that suggest B12 deficiency would be a risk factor. And the, the presentation is also predominantly motor rather than sensory, which, is, uh, which would, would have in B12. But there is some link of vitamin D or in the myopathy part of it. Uh, not that I know of. Uh, again, the literature is constantly evolving, but I don't know of the link with the vitamin D. Uh, it's a good point that uh, in B12, you would have primarily sensory symptoms. Uh, of course, it may be hard to tell in the ICU. They're not going to wake up from their sedation and complain of numbness. Uh, you, won't, you just won't know that they have uh, sensory loss. Uh, the motor weakness is what's most uh, the biggest manifestation. Sir, is there a way to mobilize the diaphragm? You know, like we, we say that if you do an early mobilization of limbs, it can actually, the outcome can be better. So is there a way to mobilize diaphragm, you know, by changing the ventilator settings? Do you have any advice for that? Uh, I don't know that there's a great way to mobilize the diaphragm like there is in, uh, uh, in the limbs. Um, Unfortunately, I, I don't know of a way to do that. There are ways that have been described to exercise the diaphragm, but you have to have enough uh, 
um, uh, enough voluntary activity to be able to exercise against resistance. So some people years ago have put, uh, say, a weight on the abdomen and have a person breathe in against the weight, and that would do some diaphragmatic strengthening uh, because you're pushing the abdominal contents down. Uh, but in these patients, they're so weak. You know, if you can't, uh, if you don't generate enough force to uh, breathe, uh, you're not going to be able to push against resistance, uh, unfortunately. Is there a ro role of lumbar puncture to differentiate uh, acute motor, motor sensory axonal neuropathy versus CI? Uh, acute uh, lumbar puncture to differentiate uh, between CI and, and uh, I think the, the lumbar puncture might help you if you're thinking about, uh, say, Guillain Barre, like we talked about before. That would help you diagnostically there. Uh, I think in the absence of that in the differential diagnosis, I'm not sure it would help you that much. You could probably see, you know, if Guillain-Barre is in the differential just from your nerve conduction studies. Uh, and if you have suggestive findings there, then it may be worth doing lumbar puncture. But in the absence of demyelination, uh, and again, I would look to Sudhir and Satish to see if you have thoughts. Uh, well, I, I don't mean, know that it would be that helpful. As you said, the nerve conduction would be less invasive. And in a person who's critically ill and who's on a ventilator, you don't really want to do a lumbar puncture. So, yeah, I yeah. don't think it's... So there are two questions on Please, role of... What do you think, yeah. uh, Sorry? Sorry? What, what do you think about lumbar puncture? They hardly ever used it. Most of the time, your clinical presentation, your electrophysiology data will tell you where you stand. Only occasionally. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Then, sir, there are two questions on muscle ultrasound. How useful it is to detect the muscle... Uh, basically waste, uh, wasting atrophy, use of muscle yeah. yeah, I wish there was a, uh, a, a good answer to that. There are some studies looking at muscle ultrasound, also uh, near, near infrared uh, spectroscopy of muscle, uh, where basically you're shining an infrared light into the muscle and picking up the reflection. Um, uh, those uh, may be abnormal, both ultrasound and the, and the infrared spectroscopy, but I don't think they add much to the, it's still in the research mode. It's not really used uh, clinically as far as I can tell. And I don't think they add much beyond doing your uh, conventional neurophysiology. I don't think it adds uh, sensitivity. Uh, they might be abnormal there, but I don't think it would really add anything to the diagnostic decision-making. So then do we have a study where they have assessed different causes of septicemia? Uh, I mean, uh, with the incidence and extent of ICU acquired weakness, comparing different causes of septicemia in causing ICU acquired weaknesses. Yeah, uh, uh, I wish it was uh, as uh, uniform as we'd like, but people come into the ICU through many different pathways. And so many different underlying diseases, many different causes of sepsis. And as far as I know, there really hasn't been a great way to uh, uh, get a pure cause of say urosepsis, that that's a, a higher risk factor than you know, other causes of ARDS or whatever. Uh, so I don't think we're down to that level where we can say one cause of sepsis is a higher likelihood than another. Uh, we're at a grosser, higher altitude level where we're saying sepsis in general, multi-organ failure, being on the mechanical ventilator for a few days, a longer period. Those are the risk factors. Uh, but I don't know that a specific uh, reason to get you in the ICU would, would be a higher risk factor. Uh, is there any study which says which are the organs which get affected first? I mean, does the person have to be drowsy and delirious? Um, can he get uh, critical illness, myopathy, neuromyopathy without going into delirium or without going into any renal dysfunction or are they happening later? Yeah, I think these are all sort of risk uh, seen as, as uh, risk factors. And so I think about it statistically is that the more of these you have, the more likely you're going to get the, the ICU acquired weakness and the less you have, the less likely so it's not, uh, I don't think of it as an all or nothing thing where if you have this one risk factor that you're definitely going to get it, or if you don't have that, you won't get it. It's just the, it's the summation of all the uh, organ failures that I think add up to a higher risk of ICU acquired weakness. But, uh, but uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no I was one say. would uh, be a 
little uh, wary or skeptical, just as in diabetic neuropathy, somebody with diabetes and neuropathy, you don't uh, want to diagnose unless the person also has some retinopathy, some uh, microscopic yeah. albuminuria. Similarly, if there is no delirium at all, there is no renal dysfunction, I would be a little wary to call this uh, a critical illness and apathy. Then you would think. And the other question which many people are repeatedly asking is, uh, what about myasthenia? So how do you distinguish? And I want to ask you, how often have you picked up myasthenia presenting first time in an ICU because he's not getting off the ventilator as against the person turning out to have critical illness and apathy? So uh, how often does it happen that it is myasthenia? Because usually it's referred as query myasthenia or something and uh, they want us to rule that out. No, that, it's a great point. Uh, I don't know that I have specific numbers for you, but I think what you're getting at is you want to take a broad view of the patient of uh, all possible neuromuscular disease. So for instance, sometimes we'll have someone who came in with difficulty breathing, they get on the ventilator. Why did they get there? Well, they had motor neuron disease that was unrecognized. And so if they got there via the ALS route, you don't want to say, oh, the motor responses are small. So this must be a critical illness myopathy and they're going to get better. Uh, so you want to do really a thorough assessment. Start from you know the very beginning. Don't, uh, and this is what your question gets to. Don't make any assumptions that it has to be just critical in this myopathy. But be uh, suspicious of uh, other more generalized neuromuscular diseases like motor neuron disease, like neuromuscular junction disease. Uh, those could be the pathways that got them in the ICU in the first place. So broad view. In some cases, you may want to do uh, repetitive stimulation studies. You may want to do a more extensive EMG to look for uh, signs of motor neuron disease, particularly if they have upper motor neuron signs. Uh, so uh, just uh, it's easy to go down that really narrow pathway of saying, oh, they just can't breathe, so it's phrenic nerve, or uh, they're weak, so this must be critical illness, uh, neuro neuropathy or myopathy. But just take that step, and you all know this, but take that step back to look at it. Yes. Somebody also wants to know yeah. clinical pearls. So, can you say as a broad, uh, just a thing, that if the person doesn't have any ptosis, any ophthalmoplegia, any dysarthria or dysphagia, then the chances of myasthenia as the cause of getting off the ventilator are slim as compared to critical illness myopathy or something. Uh, rarely you might be caught out and it might still be myasthenia, but uh, I mean, you look at the other causes yeah. first and then. Uh, Think of yeah, Satish, have you seen Satish uh, myasthenia? I was going to say that, that whenever it has been myasthenia, it has been pretty straightforward. Once you go and see, there is there is eye movement problem. Right. There are other things. It's quite unusual to just have a ventilatory failure and limb weakness and it turning out to be myasthenia. Of course, like Dr. Roberts is saying, you have to look at it, but only once in a while. But yeah, the reference is always like that. Yes. This is my statement. Yes. My, my chest physician has referred me at least 100 patients till now who are not coming off the ventilator. And once I got caught, I said, no. once he, <laughs> sent, he sent the ACHR and it came positive. And later on, the patient did turn out to have my statement. But that's the often, one he remembers. So he's always going to send them to you to hope find another <laughs> one. <laughs> and then often they will have some complaints before they came to the ICU. They will have some weakness going around and then they have landed up into the ICU with her on, on, yeah. the, on the ventilator. One yeah. patient when I got cut out didn't have anything before. No symptom, nothing, nothing. And just presented first time with uh, not coming off a ventilator with a critical illness, you know, pneumonia or something. But I mean, most of the time you are not going to find my ICU. So there's a question of direct muscle stimulation, how you, and when you do that. Yeah, so uh, there are some reports of uh, doing direct muscle stimulation and recording. Uh, this is, uh, I think, more of a research tool than a clinical tool. But basically what we do is we look at the distal uh, third of the tibialis anterior. We take that part because there's no intramuscular axons. We don't want to stimulate axons. So we put muscle, uh, we, we put uh, half inch bare needles, so like your EEG needles, into the muscle, two needles into the muscle distally in the tib anterior and stimulate. And you can see a band of muscle fibers uh, uh, twitching when you stimulate. Then you take another pair of bare needles and put those into the twitching area and stimulate uh, again and record from those other muscle, uh, those other needles. So you're able to get a muscle fiber to muscle fiber uh, response. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, you can also, while you're recording from those bare needles, stimulate the nerve, stimulate the fibular nerve at the fibular head. Uh, and the way we use this is it, uh, normally you should get a, a reasonably sized CMAP from stimulating muscle fibers and a similar response from stimulating the nerve. If you have a myopathy, then you'd get small responses from whether you stimulate the nerve or the muscle fibers, it's always gonna be small because you don't have many muscle fibers there. If you have a neuropathy, the nerves, then the muscle fiber to muscle fiber response, that should be a nice normal size, but you won't get much when you stimulate the nerve because there aren't many nerve fibers. So that's a way that's been proposed to differentiate uh, the neuropathy, the myopathy, and the normals is to do this muscle fiber stimulation. There are some technical issues. It's not easy to do, and it, there are uh, um, it's not always perfectly easy to interpret. So it's not something we always do clinically, but it is an available technique. So there's a question from Dr. Nadir, uh, Nadir sir. Any role of neuroimaging especially if the neuro examination is incomplete. And how do you distinguish the critical illness myopathy versus tachyptic myopathy? Versus any, role, any role of neuro, neuro uh, I mean, the scan section. Do you do neuro uh, uh, imaging? imaging sure, uh, especially if, if you're not able to do complete technological examination. Uh, but he wants imaging of the brain, spine, brain or, spine, or, yeah. or uh, muscle. All, all, sir. I mean, the spine and brain, basically. Yeah, I guess this gets back to sort of uh, starting from the from a broad view and doing the history, including the pre-illness history, doing your physical examination. And certainly if you see upper motor neuron findings that make you think there's something going on at the spine or brain, uh, that would be useful to do. Uh, but if your clinical presentation is really consistent with a uh, you know, a, a, a peripheral neuromuscular disease, then I'm not sure you get much from doing the central imaging. And it's not easy to do in someone with, uh, you know, who's on a ventilator too. So again, that would go to taking that initial clinical uh, view and seeing, you know, what you think is in the differential and then designing your test based on that. So probably there's a last question. How long it takes to recover from ICFYP? Yeah, uh, another one that I wish I knew, uh, and it depends, I, th I think, and this is where that we don't have enough data yet, but I think if you have a primarily, primarily or only myopathy, there we're talking in the few months range. Uh, and there's not a lot of data on this, but the little data that's out there is few months uh, that you may get some recovery. The polyneuropathy is worse. And there we're thinking many months, year or more, or maybe not get a complete recovery. So the polyneuropathy is not as good an outcome. Uh, and there you're looking at a, a prolonged uh, debility. Um, and just thinking about uh, this all in the setting of COVID-19, uh, I think we're gonna be uh, seeing a number of patients with ICU acquired weakness. The, now not, not your person who just gets mild symptoms, but the person who's been very sick in the ICU, uh, those people are likely to get this and have a prolonged debility. So even though we uh, you know, save them acutely, uh, they may have a prolonged disability out in the community for, um, uh, for quite a while afterwards. Uh, which, uh, Larry, which is the or the, the muscle or the nerve, which is the more sensitive one? That means if you take percentage wise, which one have uh, out of 100, how many will have only myopathy, how many will have both, and how many will have more toward neuropathy? Probably muscle gets affected first and then if it gets worse, then the nerve will get uh, affected. Yeah, I don't have an exact number, but uh, based on the, the muscle stimulation studies we were talking about earlier, we think that uh, the majority of weakness that you see is more caused by the myopathy, like you're saying. The muscle is probably more frequently affected. Uh, you could have both going on, but in terms of what's causing the weakness, there's a little bit of data, not as much as we'd like, uh, suggesting that maybe the, the myopathy is the primary cause. So do you get only respiratory muscle weakness without no, any limb weakness? Uh, that's very unusual. Usually it's the limbs too, but you just don't know that it's the limbs are involved. Um, would you be a little wary if the person has only neuropathy and no signs of myopathy? Uh, no, I, I see that. Uh, we do see that. 
Uh, and again, it, it's some of that might just reflect our ability to detect the myopathy that because uh, I mentioned that one study where people were uh, not overtly uh, weak, but if you do the nerve conduction studies, you will see abnormalities. So uh, some of that is just the difficulty of uh, uh, detecting uh, the myopathy or the neuropathy. They might have it, but we just might not be uh, smart enough to pick it up. Sir, uh, there is a question of ICU acquired weakness after cardiac arrest. There is no, there is no sepsis, but the patient had a cardiac arrest and had subsequently developed ICU acquired weakness. Is it different from patients who develop a sepsis and then uh, ICU acquired weakness? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's not a big uh, re not a big group that we see, at least in my experience, the cardiac arrest. Uh, now, certainly you can get the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and you can get other central issues going on. Uh, and if you're in the ICU and you develop ARDS and sepsis uh, afterwards, uh, then uh, certainly that could be a cause. Uh, but I don't think that's uh, you know, a really super high risk factor. Yeah, I mean, the brain is much more sensitive to hypoxia and uh, ischemia than muscles and nerves. So you would have much more encephalopathy than um, myopathy or neuropathy if the person had an arrest. Yeah. Well, thank you for all the questions and the yes, discussion. Yes, I'm through with been, the questions. Uh, yeah. Great. Thank it's you. been a great discussion thank and you, thank Larry. you for having me. Thank, thank you. you sir. Look thank forward. You, sir. Take care. All right. Stay safe, everyone. Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Satish. Yeah, thank, thank you both. Thank you all three. Thank you for moderating. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye now.